coming. I know it's that cocktail hour, so I hope that the coffees and cookies will suffice. Um, we're thrilled to have you here. We're thrilled to present. I think you know about the um, the fight that, that CARES, CARE is Citizens Against Rail Expansion, um, has been engaged in in the last year or so. It's been very, very successful. Um, I'm thrilled this afternoon to have a special, special man here that I'd like to have speak to you. He is a former federal prosecutor. Federal prosecutor, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> former Senate General Counsel. Former Senate General Counsel, and I know he knows a few astronauts as well. Um, Steve Ryan, our counsel, the man who is quarterbacking this fight, and really a great guy. First of all, uh, I don't have a microphone, so if my voice doesn't reach you, it'll be the first audience that doesn't reach. But anyway, you can complain any, all you want. Um, I want to tell you how important Admirals has been to this fight. Uh, Judy Goldenberg and Tom Hewitt origin were originators of CARE, of Citizens Against Rail Expansion. They created the organization. Tom Hewitt is a CEO. Where are you, Tom? You're right, right there. Oh, you're right in front of me. Uh, Tom uh, was one of my clients uh, when he was on a board of a company that became misunderstood by the government. And so we got to know, uh, know each other very well, pulling that poor company out of a ditch. Tom on the board and me as the counsel. And Tom called me one day and said, do you know anything about railroads? And I said, yeah. I won this big case. You come up front. If you get here late, you have to sit with the master. Uh, it's, uh, 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 from the First Presbyterian Church of Elvis the Divine, I'm the pastor. Uh, uh, and anyway, so I have done this case one time before. Uh, I beat a railroad that had been granted a $2.3 billion federal loan that was going to run 17 coal trains through the middle of the Mayo Hospital Clinic uh, in Minnesota, and then 17 empty ones going back each day which didn't seem like the smartest thing in the world. And the only thing that tops that is adding all of these trains to run through 10 million people on the Treasure Coast. I think, frankly, the first one was obviously stupid. This one may be even more stupid than that. And so I want to talk with you a little bit today. We're going to talk for one hour. I will remain afterwards to, to handle any questions that we don't get to. But I'm hoping that in about 30 minutes, I'll open it up for your questions. What I found, by the way, the people at Admirals are very, very smart people. And the questions are very good questions. Sometimes, I, I had a question yesterday at Sailfish, by the way. The guy said, have we put together a group to buy Fortress and just take this thing over and get rid of it that way? And only at Sailfish could you get that question. Right? Uh, so, but I'm always amused by those kind of questions here, you know, because it, the, the, the perspectives here are of really smart business people and, you know, y'all living here, this is pretty nice, by the way. I had no idea, really, until I started coming down on this case, how nice this lifestyle is here. And your lifestyle is threatened by this thing. Uh, your community is threatened. And the culture that, and, and the nice things that brought you here and that you earned all your life are at stake in this. So let me just cover... We'll cover this pretty quickly and then get to your questions. Facts. Uh, who's our opponent? It's an investment bank in New York uh, that owns, oh, I'm supposed to stay in the middle. Uh, investment bank in New York that owns the uh, railroad. They bought it and took it private. The railroad's a 352 mile freight railroad all within the state of Florida. No <laughs> railroad person in his right mind wants to run passenger trains on his freight track. In fact, it's an abomination if you're a rail guy because under Title 49, you have to give the passenger train right of precedence to travel on those tracks. So this whole idea of adding a passenger train to it is really a cover because it's really a freight play. It's to put $1.7 billion of new facilities there so they can run much heavier, much bigger, much longer freight trains on the tracks as well as the other things. And as you'll see, and I think you know, it's going to have a profound effect on the community in different ways. How many of you have traveled on a true high-speed train in Europe? Put up your hands. Japan, Korea, wherever you want it to be. Okay, so it's pretty much a universal experience. What's the difference between this project and that? You drop the train into a trench, 
so that it's not running at grade, right? There are 350 road crossings between Miami and Orlando that this railroad connects to each day. How many are in the Northeast Corridor on the Amtrak train from Washington to, to New York? How many? 14. 14. So what you have is a multiplication <coughs> of the opportunity for people to kill themselves with the train by accident. People are used to approximately a 27 mile an hour freight train to 33 miles an hour in this particular stretch coming up to Stewart where they have to slow down for the uh, bridges that uh, should be in an industrial archaeology muse museum here <laughs> at the Loxahatchee and at the St. Lucie River. And what's going to happen, by the way, is they're then going to be dodging freight trains that are moving so substantially faster that cannot stop. When you get a freight train that's three miles long, which is what they're planning to run, uh, because they can't run more trains, even with the new facilities they're going to build, it'll take them miles to stop after they hit a car or hit a person on the tracks. And not everybody in this community has an S-Class Mercedes like Hewitt. Uh, you know, there's, you see, by the way, in some of these towns, people taking their children across the tracks in strollers, and they have grocery bags or a child in hand. And so people are used to crossing those tracks because it's the only way they can get across. Um, we're on this side of the track and our hospitals on the other side of the track. So if you have a heart attack or a stroke and the ambulance can't get over here to get you or can't get back, then you're going to die. And so we kicked off our campaign by addressing this issue in October by addressing some of these public safety issues. Um, this was intended for the audience up the road. This is the uh, information about the growth of the trains. Um, in 2016, they're expecting to run 28 freight trains a day. And those freight trains are not going to increase in number, they're going to increase in length. Um, so when, by the way, when you stop a three mile long train, what happens to the crossings that you're stopped by? You can't go across, right? So the bridges here are currently closed about three and a half hours a day on average. They're going to be closed nine and a half hours a day, according to the cal These are not scary things. These are the actual calculations of what's going to occur. So cars are going to back up on the roads, which is okay because you can put your car in park and do your email, uh, you know, call somebody. You can use the time, right? If you're in a boat, you're going to have to station keep. And when the bridge comes back up, whichever line gets going first, you may not have, you know, it may be only one side that will get through, right? Can you imagine the guy gunning at the front of the thing to make sure that it's his line that gets through versus the other line? Okay. So it's going to be very interesting. Very interesting. Um, we've talked a little bit about the congestions. We've talked a little bit about the crossings. So. What is the money that admirals gave us been used for? Uh, how do we account to you for the money that you've given us? Well, first of all, the money's gone to pay me. And what I have done is use that money then to hire the correct experts. And again, Hewitt, I gotta give credit to Hewitt. This is really remarkable. We were interviewing to find the right expert on Coast Guard and water and bridge issues. And you would calls me up and says, I got the right guy for you. And it turned out to be, as opposed to most of the calls I get from down here that say, I got the right guy for you, then they're not. You had had the right guy. And the same way I hope that you'll conclude uh, when I'm finished with the case that you got the right guy as your lawyer. So we got this guy, Captain Goward, who had been a rescue helicopter for the Coast Guard, risen to four star or four strike rank, retired, and then became the executive at the Coast Guard in charge of the bridge program. That's not a bad pedigree, right? So we got him to write reports about the bridges. And what he said is the bridges are, quote, an impediment to navigation, which is the statute that the Coast Guard operates under, and you're not supposed to be an impediment to navigation. He said, without change, without the addition of the new trains, it's an impediment to navigation now. Okay, it's inappropriate. And yet, when the Department of Transportation allowed AAF to pay a contractor to do the report that
that became the official Department of, of Transportation report, they said it was all fine. And you'd put the same bridges would just be going up and down a lot more and would be carrying all of the additional activity that's going on. So Captain Goward's a representative thing of what Admiral's money paid for in the process that we were doing. That came to a culmination on December 4th last year where we commented on the draft environmental impact statement. And I'll bring you current with that activity soon. The, I love these pictures. These are Goward's <laughs> pictures. He's not a photographer. But this looks like a scrapyard. I mean, I, I don't know if you can see it from your seat, but those pictures are in the file that we turned over to the federal government, and they're right on the page. I made sure that a judge would be able to see the pictures and get a feel for the antiquity and lack of care of the bridges and the other facilities along the line. This is the bridge at uh, um, up in Stewart, I believe. Let me see. No, that's the Loxahatchee Bridge. That's that's here. I must have been the other one. That's the St. Lucie Bridge. Uh, they they share antiquity. Um, you know, uh, President Roosevelt would have approved of them when they were built. Uh, and so, the funding. Let's talk about who our opponent is. First of all, what do investment banks do? They play with other people's money. So what they're doing is trying to get Uncle Stupid to pay for their railroad, okay? And there's gonna be a consistent theme of looking for subsidies from the public for their project, although they claim that they're gonna be privately financed. So when I was hired originally in this case, they had sought a $1.8 billion loan from the federal government. And the way the loan works, by the way, is if you get the loan, they start with the treasury rate, and there's a lot of business people here, so I'll, I'm gonna talk real fast, right? They start with the treasury rate, and then the interest rate goes up based on the risk of non-payment. So there's a subjective judgment, just like a bank would do, only it's the Department of Transportation, under the deputy secretary that's supposed to assign a risk factor to that loan. OMB hates this program because every time you do a loan like this, you increase the deficit by the amount of the, of the risk that the government's taking on the loan, okay? So if you take a, give, give out a loan for $1.8 billion and the collateral's only worth a billion, there's an $800 million, or $800 million goes to the deficit. It increases the deficit because that's what has to go on the books as a deficit of the United States. Okay, So what we think has happened, they switched their funding model between the time I was hired in June and December 22nd uh, of last year. On a gradual basis, they switched from RIF loan to bond funding, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But this RIF loan still sits there. They can come back to it and do it if they need to. So. What's a private activity bond? A private activity bond is the federal version of a municipal tax exempt bond. There's a statute in the IRS code and then other statutes poured into that statute and the federal government can be in the tax exempt bond business. And what they've done here is issued a letter that allows this railroad to get 1.7 billion in tax exempt bonds. So among the things that Admiral's money has permitted us to do is we hired a professor. And we didn't just hire any professor, we had hired this very interesting young professor who had just left the White House. He had been on the NEC staff. He's a PhD from Berkeley who's now uh, at Brown University trying to essentially do what the Kennedy School does at, at Harvard to create a similar school. He's part of the cadre of young professors taken from Harvard that are trying to do that at Brown. And what he said is the taxpayer subsidy for those bonds is 37 to 60 million a year. In other words, in foregone revenue to the United States. Now, the most interesting part of this is the only thing in the statute that would appear to cover a passenger chain like this is a provision that says if it goes 150 miles an hour or more, you can get a bond for it. Well, the surprising thing is this train 
doesn't go 150 miles an hour. It's not a high-speed train as defined in the statute. The locomotives, for example, only go, it's like church. If you come in late, you have to come up with the pastor. Come on, come on. Uh, the, the, uh, it's not a problem. We'll just all watch. No, I'm only kidding. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having fun. Um, so this is not high-speed rail as defined in the statute. So one would think that they can't give a bond to a train that doesn't qualify in that regard. Uh, and the way that the government got around that issue is they said, oh, it's actually a highway we're giving the bonds to. So I'm not, I'm from New York. I grew up as a city kid. I'm the only kid now who has shotguns rather than zip guns, you know, from, from the neighborhood. I've gone from the situation of knowing that there were police horses that walked backwards with their rump into you to going to farms where there were four horses that you could ride. Um, but what I didn't understand was how a railroad became a highway. And here's the Department of Transportation's decision about that. They said, well, you know, Ryan, you've been deeply concerned about those 350 crossings. So we're giving them the $1.7 billion so that they can build safe connections to the highway. So what that means is the Department of Transportation has rewritten the law that if there's a highway that connects or crosses a railroad, they can do whatever they want. And I believe that's illegal. And I think if you listen to what I just said to you, that's the government's theory on how they can give the bond. And I'm about to give that a test with your money, okay? So we're probably headed to a United States District Court where my hope is that a judge is going to look at them and say, really? That's really your theory? That because a highway crosses it, you can get a $1.7 billion bond? Doesn't that mean that every railroad in America could get anything the Department of Transportation wants to give it? Well, that can't be the law, can it? Because even the court will see the 150 mile an hour thing that Congress has spoken on this issue. So when we began this case, we didn't know any of this stuff. We, we knew, you could tell the bridges were antique, but you had to hire a gallery. You knew that the railroad was doing funny things with the numbers because I may be willing to pay $234 to, fly, uh, to take the train from my office in Washington and New York because at both we have the metro, you, know, uh, uh, you have the metro that you can rely upon. Um, Miami to Orlando is different, okay? Uh, and it, it's not the same kind of thing, but only a single business traveler would pay the kind of fare that you would need to do because when you get to Orlando, you still got to pay $75 for a cab to the park, or you have to pay $75 to get to, to, old, uh, to old Orlando, to the, to the city, right? You're stranded in a sense when you get to the end of the line. In Miami, is a little bit more spread out than a Washington or a New York in the sense of public transportation being accessible. All right, so I'm going to shoot through this. This is Professor Friedman. Friedman says if you add up the debt, even if I accept the railroad's estimation, they should charge you $273 for the ticket in order to service their debt. He says if I just take the railroad's assumptions, they're going to lose $100 million a year. Now. I don't know how many of you are living here who had businesses that lost $100 million a year on a consistent basis right out of the box. But I doubt it. I mean, I doubt that many of you would be sitting here if that was your business plan. This stuff I've covered, this is important. Uh, the governor here gave $214 million to the railroad to build a rail station at the Orlando airport for which there's only one customer all aboard Florida. Now, it's a multi-transit hub, except there's nobody else hubbing to it. So the hubbub is that AAF gets a subsidy from you as the taxpayers in Florida of $214 million. Uh, the $10 million here is to make the corridor safer because the railroad doesn't want to pay for the upgrades in safety that, okay, everybody needs to turn off their phone. Uh, the $10 million, I'm kidding, $10 million to, uh, to upgrade the safety in the corridor, it costs about a million dollars per intersection to improve the safety 
with, you have to have a perimeter gating system. You can't have the gates that are there. Uh, how many of you grew up in the Midwest or the West? You got anybody here? You remember slaloming around the gates, right? You can't let people slalom with high speed or higher speed rail. And with two tracks, because you may mask the one train. There'll be a long freight going this way. You won't see a fast moving passenger train going the other way. So it costs about a million dollars. The railroad doesn't want to pay for that. Don't want to pay for it. And they want you to pay in the future for the maintenance of that. Under the current system in Florida, by the way, it's an outrage. The counties actually get a bill from the railroad so that you're not killed on the tracks. They do a truck roll to protect the, uh, to, to do some work on the gates. They send a bill to the county and you as taxpayers pay for it. That's the current system and they like that fine. And unless you agree with them, that's what they intend to do in the future. Okay, there is a solution. I don't care if they built a perfectly nice passenger rail that goes from Miami to West Palm Beach. Mazel tov, enjoy your railroad, okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's fine in that corridor. What we do object to is them running it through the Treasure Coast with no benefit to this community. So as far as we're concerned, the alternate routes that would take the train west that is the same way the Amtrak train <coughs> comes down from Orlando to Miami now. That would be the appropriate corridor because there aren't 10 million people there. There aren't, there aren't the marinas on this side of the railroad <coughs> tracks or the hospital on each side. So it's a very logical thing to think that that's where it should be. There's a very famous case. How many lawyers here? Put up your hands. So the first day we're in law school, they teach you the case about the pig farm and how people moved to the, towards the pig farm as the land became more valuable. And finally they said, well, you've got to close down the pig farm because it makes a lot of smell for us, right? This is the opposite. It's the pig farm is expanding and it's going to take away your lifestyle, right? It's going to change everything here so that you can't get across the tracks when you need to. So what do we need? We have a three-part strategy. Uh, I'm, because I'm a lawyer, I don't believe that you solve all problems with a legal hammer. Um, many lawyers do, by the way. They, they have one thing they do well, they do law. I'm not that lawyer. I actually do public relations well, I do lobbying and legislation well, and I, I literally have a three-part strategy for us. I believe you have to have all those elements working together and when I was hired by Tom and Judy and the others, I laid out this strategy on day one. I said, this is how you defeat it. And that's what we've been doing with your money. So right now, I wear three hats. I'm CARES lawyer. I've also been hired as the lawyer, it chokes me up. Um, I've been hired as the lawyer for Martin County temporarily. I'm, I'm representing Martin County as well. And I've also been hired by the town of Jupiter Island all as a result of care. In other words, I wouldn't have been in the game to get those other representations. And those are very helpful representations because the counties have now put up money. Indian River County and St. Lucie, uh, pardon me, and uh, Martin County have put up 1% of their budget to fight this project. When we started, it wasn't cool, okay? It wasn't what people understood. They didn't understand what's in this presentation. In fact, we didn't entirely understand what's in this presentation without studying it. So there's a legal component to this, and this case will end in the United States District Court, either in Washington, uh, in uh, Fort Pierce, in West Palm, or in Miami. There are four places where the case could exist, and we're gonna go to court someday with your money, and we're gonna either win or lose the case in court. Now, there are points of failure for the railroad that are political. Um, let me give you an example of the political activity that we're doing. Today, Judy and I just got back from meeting with Senator Rubio's senior staff. Senator Rubio has a couple of times flirted with us in public when he said critical things about the railroad. He hasn't said he's against the project, and he certainly hasn't said he's for it. So we met with his staff today to give them all of the arguments as to why politically it was important to the senator, factually and legally and in other ways, to be with his constituents on this issue. 
We've been working with Patrick Murphy, who is the Democratic congressman here, who's been very good to us on this case. We've been working with Bill Posey, who's the Republican congressman just up the road, and he's done us a big favor. He filed a letter with the Inspector General on Friday of the Department of Transportation and raised the illegality of the highway issue. So we have the first public official who's called for an investigation of the Inspector General of the Department to raise the issue of whether it's an illegal expenditure to do the bonds. Now, none of this stuff happens in a vacuum, right? Um, it's hard work to get these people to pay attention. You're a critical part of that. And the other thing that's a critical part of it is a great press. And we hired a nationally known, internationally known um, uh, PR firm, Hill and & Knowlton. And as always, by the way, the best business people, and there are a lot of good business people in the room here, you don't hire my law firm, you hire me, and you get the law firm, right? You're, you're hiring an individual to lead your team. Well, we did the same thing at Hill & Knowlton. There are two women who lead our team at Hill & Knowlton. One of them is President, Bo uh, President, sorry, uh, from maybe, <coughs> maybe a premonition of the future, <laughs> Governor Bush's press secretary, who's our person in Tallahassee on the press side, and a woman who is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter that Tom and I knew, who's in Washington, and we're working with them in the case. So when you get hit and the assessment for the dues, that's where your money has gone to. It's gone to these sets of activities to make us everything that we are today, which is we've turned this case from a situation where we were the anvil and now we're the hammer, okay? We have taken over the public consciousness of this and changed it. We have made it clear to people here what the danger is. A lot of you knew a lot of what we were saying today because you've read it in the newspaper, because you've heard it from your friends, because we've been proselytizing uh, in, and doing this. And I have to say it came from admirals, from Blah Blahly, from mariners, from a handful of clubs that carried us to this point. So that's what we've been doing with your money. That's the activity that we've been covering. Let me see if there's anything else we really need to do. Other than this, let's talk about this. So December 4th, we put all of our comments in, and we understand the Department of Transportation is going to give us the big raspberry. They're just going to, if we call in the Bronx, you get the big noise, and they're going to go final. They're going to go ahead and drive this project to conclusion because the Department of Transportation in Washington wants it to succeed. Okay? So at that point, we'll have to go to court and argue that our comments were correct and that the department is not correct in going ahead. It's not a case where I can call you, can't call Don Young, I can't call Tom Hewitt to the stand or Judy Goldenberg. It has to be in the record. And we spent almost $100,000 of the collective money of the clubs to put those comments in that allow us to make that argument on the day that they go final with this. These are some of the things we've done. These are some of the people that have helped us. I had Congressman Murphy on there. I should have Congressman Posey right there with him. We're bipartisan, by the way. If you're with us, we don't care what you're Democrat or Republican. We don't care if you're conservative or liberal. We want you with us. This is a Republican state senator and an important one. And then uh, three of the four of these, Larry Lee's a Democrat, the others are Republican. So these are people who have helped us, and if you know them, I want you to uh, thank them. Now, you live in a county that hasn't done anything for us. Uh, in fact, they've not been very concerned about it. So you need to proselytize with your uh, county leadership about what's going on here, because Barton County up the road and Indian River seem to know something that your leaders don't know. Um, now, in truth, we haven't had enough money to run a proper lobbying campaign here. We just haven't been able to do it. And tomorrow, we're going to hire our lobbyist in Tallahassee for the first time, which was in our original plan on day one, but we could never fund it until today. Um, and by the way, we just had a meeting at Sailfish yesterday, and a room like this, they gave us $60,000 in checks before I left the room. Right in the room, I got 60000 bucks. So people are becoming concerned, and they understand 
there's a direct correlation that if we have enough money to do this fight, um, that, it, that we're going to win, okay, that we can win. How many of you before you came in here thought we were going to lose this fight? Go ahead. Well, you know, if you had asked six months ago, I used to tell Tom and Judy, the ingredients are here to win this case, but I'm not sure. Now I'm here to tell you, I think we're going to win. I actually, it's really dangerous when your lawyer starts to drink his own bathwater, uh, and I, I try never to do that. Um, I don't want to cl create client expectations that I can't fulfill. There's nothing worse, but I'm 34 years in this game, okay? I'm not at my first rodeo, and I think we're going to win. I think the tide has turned in this case. I think the things that are happening now and the work we've done together, the intellectual brain power and attacks we've brought to this, it's not about rhetoric, it's not being against the train, it's not that the train's a bad thing, it's these very intense intellectual pieces that we have to do. It's rifle shooting. We're in a knife fight for the future of your community, okay? And that's what we're doing with your money. So we've got this big fight coming up. This is all about it. You've already joined us, and, you know, I just want to thank you because at the beginning, it wasn't clear we could get to where we are today, and it's not clear that we're going to win. But we certainly have turned uh, this. We had the battle of Midway about six or eight weeks ago, if you know your historical metaphors. We're, we're in a different position now, okay? We're not on our heels. We're going forward. So let me stop and take whatever questions you may have. Um, it's cocktail hour in half an hour. You're going to have a lot of smart questions, but I'm going to cut it off at 5.30, and I'll stay for anybody whose question isn't done. I'm going to go here, then to that row. There's three questions, so you, you're first, sir. Uh, <clears throat> if all of Ford, Florida is a subterfuge, we're bringing more freight, why the subterfuge? Why not just uh, build the extra track for freight and put the freight that they want coming out of Miami and Fort Lauderdale and run it up the, the tracks that they currently have, have the freight on? So they can do that, by the way, right? Um, but it isn't cool. And if you go to the market, <coughs> Fortress would need to go to the market and get $1.7 billion for a freight railroad. Um, they've had to put a billion dollars in. Unlike uh, Warren Buffett, who bought uh, the Burlington Northern as part of his long-term play, these guys came in and bought this railroad just before the recession. And originally, there were 28 freight trains a day, and now there are 14. Okay, so what's happened is they bought an asset, they had to put a lot of additional money in, <coughs> And it, what do investment banks do? Well, they flip things, right? They buy low, spruce it up, put some paint on it, uh, you know, it, put a new dress on the pig and put it back out there, right? They can't do that with this railroad right now until they succeed with this plan. Now, let's talk about the freight for a minute. They have a problem on this railroad, which is that the southern bound freight is much heavier than the northern bound freight they currently have a big imbalance because the stuff that's coming south is goods that people in Florida actually want that are either transshipped from another railroad or from another part of the state, okay? Because the, the FEC connects to other railroads even though it's only 352 miles long. The problem is they don't have enough freight going north. So one of the things that they think is going to be their salvation and that they've put out in the prospectus is that the Panamax ships are going to come to the Miami port and the Miami port's going to put them on the rails, and this is going to be the path going up for that Panamax ships. Panamax ships are something on the order of four and five times the size of a normal container ship, and, then, and they're calling it Panamax because the Panama Canal has been amended to allow these behemoths to go through. It used to be that you had 990 feet was the biggest ship that you could get through the canal, which is why most U.S. aircraft carriers before the nuclear navy were 989 feet long because um, you can then transfer them from ocean to ocean. But now they're going to have the Panamax ships. So the freight play, it's not real cool to say, we want a public subsidy so that the sugar growers can move their, their cane better. And so I think that's part of it, but it's not mine to reason why. It's absolutely clear that they need the extra track 
to run both freight and passenger at the same time. Can't do it otherwise. But spend the money to put the track in. Why go through all this subterfuge? Just let them put the extra track in. They own the land. They, they do own the land, and that's why they want it in this corridor and not going out west where it should go. Okay? Anyway, I, I don't know. That's the best I can do to answer your question. I'm going to go here. One, two, three. How much of this uh, could the citizens uh, benefit if the state government in Florida uh, took all the cries under consideration and decided to move forward for the benefit of the citizens of Florida? Or is it just the old political game? Well, uh, you know, mentioned I think Governor the, Chris, I think, putting some $200 million. No, no, Governor Scott. Scott. Okay, Governor Scott. Chris has not been governor Department for some time Transportation. Now. I'm sorry, sir? The Department of Transportation. Right. So let, let, me, let me just say it this way. The Federal Department of Transportation and FDOT, your local Department of Transportation, are both in the tank for the project. They want the project to go, and they want it to succeed, and they don't care what the facts are. They just don't. But, well, uh, for the Federal Department of Transportation, you really want the only passenger train in the world that's not subsidized. That's the theory, right? They're arguing that they're going to create a passenger train that goes by itself. There is no other passenger train in the world like that. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that? I, I, I don't know why they're doing it. Quite candidly, it doesn't make much sense. And that's what Professor Friedman said. That's why we tried to address the economics of it, that it doesn't work from an economic standpoint. But that's what's going on. And Governor Scott, candidly, is in the tank for this project. He killed the Tampa to Orlando Railroad that the federal government was going to give him $2 billion to run on the argument he didn't want to pay the subsidy that would be necessary to keep the railroad open later. In other words, the whole railroad was being paid for with federal money, but he didn't want to subsidize it later. That was the argument. Well, one of the members of his team who left him is on this team that handled the killing of the other railroad. Is that... The newspapers have written about it. I don't know, you know if you've seen that story, but it's interesting. So the bottom line is, there are people here, the sugar growers, uh, the people in Orlando and Miami and the Chamber of Commerce who think it's a great thing. Um, but those people here in this area, I think, have a different view. Let me go to the second question. Um, I wonder if you could expand a bit on what you mean by win. And, and, and I asked the question, for example, if all aboard Florida builds all their commercial properties in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm, operates the train, and, and everything then goes west, mm -hmm. is that win? That's a win. That's okay. a total win. And I, Mazel Tov, they have a successful commuter rail that covers that area. They then have an inner, uh, inner, uh, or it's not interstate, but okay. they have a, they have a very successful long-term run. So your Miami. activities really don't bear upon everything from West Palm South? Correct. I don't care. That, well, I'm not paid to care. No, I am. Um, <laughs> but actually, as a public policy matter, I think that would be the wrong argument, okay? I don't care if they run down there. No, my concern is once they do that, right. it seems to me it, it puts additional burden on your argument. If they're already to West Palm, you know, then they but, have a they have a, a stronger case. But the federal environmental act says you're supposed to look at all the alternative routes, and I'm telling you now, I've never seen a bigger piece of garbage than the Dias in this case because they didn't really examine that route. There's one page. They don't own that route. That's correct. They, and it, it was really interesting. There's one paragraph in this thing that is the the crucible of the whole case, and it says there's three reasons why we picked this route rather than that route. Okay. The first one is it's owned by the railroad, and therefore it's cheaper. Second, it would delay the project to go west rather than to go straight on the existing uh, facilities. And I forget, can't remember what the third one was. I mean, it made no sense at all. I think way. it was that they have all customers up this. No, it really wasn't that. It, 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 it was I, I'm worse, not saying that's true. It was but worse I, than that. I, I think I could, that was I their I wish point. I had the page in front of me. I used to do dramatic readings of that page back in the, in the fall because it made no sense at all. And, you know, you don't have to be a lawyer to know that that doesn't make any sense, that you, you don't do that alternative because it doesn't belong to the railroad. That's not supposed to be the analysis, okay? I know it's inconvenient for them to have to do a different plan, but there's green field 
in the center of the state where 10 million people don't live. So theoretically, it's cheaper to do that as well. Um, good. And then the third question in that room. Yeah, my question really related to the motivation of uh, uh, Governor Scott on the one hand, and then secondly, Department of Transportation. But And I think you responded to that. But Department of Transportation is just one arm of the federal government. Right. Um, Good question. Why Why is it that it is taking that position in other parts of the federal government? There you go. Not, uh, you get the button. I'm, I'm giving you the button. Would you give me the button? There we go. Um, you get the button. So the, the United States government is much like the former Yugoslavia. There's Serbia. There's Kosovo. There's Bosnia. There's different pieces of the government, right? So the Coast Guard happens to be a piece of the United States government. It used to be part of the Department of Transportation. It's now part of the Department of Homeland Security. The Coast Guard has a mandate about the bridges, okay? So one of the hopes we have is that while the Department of Transportation may be in the tank for this project, that the Coast Guard, which is a military service in time of war, and they wear a uniform, will not lie for their government the way the Department of Transportation is lying because they're military officers and will assess this more carefully. And Captain Gower, who used to be in charge of the bridge program, has said it's an impediment to navigation now. Okay? So I have still some hope for the Department of Transportation being persuaded by the Coast Guard that what it's doing is wrong. But everything I hear from the Department is they don't care. They don't care. So the Coast Guard's going to have to make an uncomfortable decision to go against the former secretary of trans to to go against their own former secretary and department in that regard, the Army Corps of Engineers is a third place where this case could end. The Army Corps has to deal with the manatees and the other stuff like that, uh, and the water-based activities of how the piers of the bridges intersect with the water and all of that. Uh, I've never been a big fan of the Army Corps of Engineers in terms of their integrity. They're the same people that drowned New Orleans. In other <laughs> words, they set up systems in 1927 and in 2005 that let one of America's major cities be destroyed, in essence, because they didn't do the right thing. They didn't do the right thing for decades before those times, and they haven't rectified their problems. So candidly, our best play is the Coast Guard. Now, the other best play would be if we find President Obama's fingerprint on this, because the Republicans will hate that, right? So we filed FOIAs of the White House and of OMB to see if White House or OMB are applying pressure to any of these services, including the Commandant of the Coast Guard. So I'm looking for that elusive link. Every once in a while, you open a door in a darkened room and shoot at something, and you hear the body fall. Most of the times, you don't hear anything because you've missed, right? So we have some plays that we've made, like filing the FOIA, uh, and he was the king of FOIAs, by the way. I keep coming back to him. He was the king of FOIA in Washington. He probably filed more FOIAs in the course of his business than anybody else. Because every once in a while, you find something very interesting in a FOIA. But most of the time, you find nothing at all. So we're, we're making that play. Let me go over here. And I need a woman to ask the next question after that. In this yeah, climate, in this, uh, climate, political climate, we have 50,000 signatures. We got the grassroots. We got the community. And you have to make a, a statement. And the statement has to go to some of our leaders, that are, whether they're Republican or Democratic right. and all. Don't you think that it, we have to have the Martin counties and the Jupiters and all being heard? We're not being heard unless you make a statement. Unless you make, because the papers are not getting, you see a little thing on the FEC that uh, is fixing some of the bridges only because we made a statement. We had the, the people who were blocked in all. Don't you think if the grassroots, this girl at Casey that got 50,000 uh, signatures, had uh, 50 people stand by a railroad station or something just with a Blake on, and the people and the, and the constituents and the political leaders see that their constituents are against this, I think you can get some movement from our... Well, look, we've collected as CARE about $750,000.
and we probably have about 200,000 of that we haven't expended, maybe 250. So when I won the case in Minnesota, I spent $5 million to win it, okay? I cannot duplicate that without the political arms like Indian River County and Martin County and others doing it. Now, I do think that the public opinion caused the leadership of those counties, like Bob Solari up in Indian River, has been against this from the beginning. He's been terrific, right? Uh, Commissioner, it's not the fish, it's not Haddock, it's Hat. The commissioner in Martin County, he's been t terrific on this project, right? Murphy's been terrific. Posey's now been terrific. You do it one by one, one public official at a time, you convert them because it's the right thing to do for their constituents. But we're not going to convert Governor Scott. The only thing we can do is get Governor Scott out of the fight. Maybe he could leave us alone. That's all we can ask for. Now, don't, don't do this by party, but how many of you made a political contribution in 2014? Just put up your hand if you made a political contribution. Okay, you're a donor. You're a special person to a politician, right? They know who their donors are. So if any of the people that we're talking about, the governor, the senators, Bill Nelson, Marco Rubio, the Congress people, the county commissioners, if any of those people are your people that you gave money to, then you need to let them know about this. And we have all their addresses on the CARE website. And Judy, Judy and Tom will help you find that and, and communicate with them. So I challenge you back that you have to do that. You as the taxpayers. And believe me, how many of you voted last year? You know, I can't do that in a room full of 25-year-olds, right? They don't vote. And they count on 25-year-olds not voting when they take their positions. They know that the people in this room vote. They know you're their donors, and they know you care about public policy issues because you're trying to leave something to your children, right? That's all you care about is that you leave a better world to your children. And a better world in this case is not having the choo-choo train uh, become an albatross. How many of you read The Octopus by Frank Norris when you were in school? I mean, this is not a new tale of railroads being used to, to control communities in an inappropriate way. Now, do we have a question from a woman? <laughs> I'm alone. All right. Well, <laughs> next to a woman. That's close enough. Sir, talking points. Yeah. Do you have or can you create a list of talking points so people, like many of us in here, would like to write using the facts, not other articles we right. see in the paper? So, let, let me say that the simple message is, point one, I oppose any public subsidy for this project. I don't think the project should go forward. I think it's going to affect our health and safety, and I don't want you supporting it, and I'm willing to vote against you if you do. It's really almost that simple. That's the mantra. And that, that's the kind of messaging that they need to hear from you, okay? Or if you run into Patrick Murphy, who was with us before it was cool to be with us, you say, Patrick, I'm a Republican, but I was wi I'm with you because of what you did on that. And if you're a Democrat and you see Bill Posey, then you say, Bill, you know, I don't particularly like your politics, but I really like what you did here, and it's important to me. In other words, it's, it's a message that says, I'm paying attention to that. I'm, I'm with you on that. I think we have some messaging on the website. The website's pretty good on this stuff, and the addresses of these people are on there, okay? No, but let, let yeah, me repeat ahead. my question. Please. We could really use a list of talking points, and I'm talking about 354 grade crossing. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, the number of minutes it's going to be down. This is on the website, by the way. Well, the railroads are saying 33 seconds, and we're saying two and a half minutes. Yeah. All these kind of talking points, right. so we can be effective in writing the newspapers, sure. writing <coughs> all the people we need to write that you were suggesting and more. And and I think that's up there. What we haven't done is scripted letters for people. No, not that. Just talking. But, but like this is up there. I have a version of this that's up there. Has been since we did an event at the Lyric Theater on the twenty, uh, not the twenty third yesterday. The last event we did, the Crandall event. So we do have some stuff up, but let me think about whether we can do better on that, okay? Good. Thank you for the support, though, of wanting to do it. Sir? Outside of the ownership of the rail, the western tracks, 
is it a viable proposition to go west? Absolutely. Or is there anything in the middle of the state that's going to have be a hindrance as well? Well, no. Th there's a rail corridor there already, right? Okay. So the CSX corridor already exists, and you can parallel that. And, it, and in essence, there aren't 10 million people there. So is there, is there an environmental issue there? I'm sure there is. But there's a lot of environmental issues here with Jonathan Dixon State Park, with the Vero Man, uh, with real issues that exist along this corridor. And here's the problem with this corridor, by the way. This corridor has to be able to be evacuated. And those trains are actually going to impede the evacuation of the corridor. Um, they're going to be a big problem. And those bridges uh, you know, might cause a lot of problems when you're trying to get the boats to safety. Uh, in the marinas and, and that activity, right? Um, so, you know, there's public safety issues here. We're about to come out with some really killer stuff on public safety. In every firehouse in America, there's software that geographically maps the impact of a potential accident. You may see in the very near future such maps that show what it looks like in <coughs> Martin County, particularly, or Indian River County, when you have an ammonia car or a chlorine car that's penetrated. And ammonia and chlorine are on the train every day. Uh, Timothy McVeigh blew up the Oklahoma City building with anhydrous ammonia. Anhydrous ammonia is occasionally on the train. It's like a rolling bomb, okay, of compressed and pressured. It, it explodes like C4. It, it, it's, it, fertilizer bombs are what the people in Iraq are using, or in Afghanistan, to kill our people. You know, they use fertilizer in a can to kill as an IED uh, with a, an Iranian detonator in it, okay? So we're going to show some maps, and it's going to show schools that are within the dead zone. There are six-mile dead zones from some of those accidents. Now, are we going to have more accidents if they're running 30 large freight trains and 32 passenger trains? Then under the current thing where there's 14, 350 crossings. How many school buses cross the tracks in Martin County every month? 1,800. You know that. You've been around. Uh, you know, there are a lot of public safety issues that we're going to bring to the public, and it takes time and money to do that. That's what your money's been used for, by the way. I, I, by the way, we have spent that money ultra carefully. I mean, we have really done a very good job of doing that. We're doing this case on a shoestring by comparison to what we need to do to win it. That's okay. We can be mammals and we're smarter and we run in between the dinosaur legs of the railroad. Okay? This today, by the way, was one of my favorite days because Fortress is listed as one of the top ten buyers of lobbying service in America. Okay? Now, I don't know what other project they're doing that they're spending all that money on. They must have another one. But I found both, most of the lobbyists in Tallahassee had been paid off. They were conflicted out. Uh, major law firms were conflicted out, right? Uh, and so they've spread the money around, by the way, on this project. Not in a bribery sense. Nothing inappropriate, I'm sure. Um, but they've spent a ton of money. And we are just, we are really doing very well intellectually against them. We're matching ourselves not with rhetoric, and candidly, not with petitions. <coughs> when you get a petition with 50,000 names on it, what do you do with it? I mean, I, I love the energy and the integrity that people have brought to that, but at the end of the day, it's Captain Goward and Friedman and a rail expert that are going to win this case for us. And the maps of what the plume looks like in the dead zone where you have to evacuate. That's how we're going to win this case. We have seven minutes left before cocktails. With all, with all the uh, railroad crossings, yep. what's being done with rights of way? Because okay, this this is interesting. Yeah, let me let me see if I can explain this. It is not part of our strategy, by the way. But let me let me explain what I I think has happened here. Because the railroad is so old, it's the Henry Flagler Railroad that settled Florida. They own the tracks in fee simple, unlike every other railroad that cross the Boston Post Road up in New York or in Massachusetts, then in that case it was the rail that came after the road and they had to get an easement to cross the public highway. It's the reverse here. 
There was nothing here at the time. So most of the roads, we have to have an easement to go across their track because it's in fee simple, okay? Uh, from a legal standpoint, we could do eminent domain as the government, not care, right? Uh, only governments have the right under the Fifth Amendment to take property and then you have to compensate them. I'm not sure where that leaves us. And candidly, I read a wonderful memo from Brevard County, which is also in the tank for the project, um, although politically is changing, where the last page of the memo, I got through pages 1 through 11 and page 12 didn't make any sense to me at all about how you could turn this into a strategy. So I've abandoned this issue as not important to us, but at the end of the day, I'm taking out contingencies when I wear the hat of another client where I'm actually thinking about what to do with it there, but I'm not convinced that there's a silver bullet in it that I can win the project and kill this thing with that issue, if that helps. Uh, I've thought about it, but I, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it because I, I just, I don't see the ingredients there, and I have to make choices about how we spend our legal budget. Sir, uh, I've, got, I've had you before. Let me just see if there's anybody else. Sir. Why are you so optimistic about your ability to win this if you know that <laughs> Fortress has unlimited funds and has spread the money widely around? And it doesn't, we don't have a monopoly on brains. I mean, clearly, they are able to hire. No, they're, they're very bright people. They can. So why is it that $750,000 or whatever the ultimate sum turns out to be is enough to take a <coughs> company this size? Because, because, because here's the question. The question is, Ryan, you're kind of stupid. You're suggesting to us that you can win this fight even though you're, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. you're outnumbered, you're outgunned. They're as smart as you, which is probably more than true. What we are doing is focusing on the fissure points in their plan, right? Uh, we're, we're focusing on a kill strategy. And there's multiple points of failure in their plan. Let me give you one that we haven't talked about. I don't think we talked about. Did we talk about the Florida Development Corporation? No. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Um, the Florida Development Corporation had to approve the bonds. And on August 20th, they had a secret decoder ring meeting where they voted to approve the bonds. Nobody knew about it. In fact, nobody knew about it until October 7th when AAF announced that the bonds had been approved in August and that happened to be the very day that we were having our press conference at Jupiter about the health and safety. What a mistake. She's proving that they're really smart. They stepped on our message and it came right into our press conference where we're concentrating on safety where they announced they had switched from the bonding or switched to bonding from the from the RIF loan, okay? Showing these guys are very clever. But what happened in August is there were three people of the five that took that vote. Only one of them was properly appointed, appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. The other two, it was like they walked into the room. It'd be like, you know, you go to a commission meeting and the guy says, well, I'm a commissioner. And the other guy says, well, I'm a commissioner. And the third guy who really was a commissioner says, well, I'm a commissioner. And then they voted. So it's pretty much clear that that initial vote is unlawful. So if you think about it now, what do they have to do? The governor is appointing new people to the Florida Development Corporation so they can have a vote again, only this time it won't be a super secret vote because we now know that they're doing this. At the time, we didn't even know to look at it because we thought they were doing a RIF loan and not bonding, right? So we weren't even looking at the agenda. So now, one of the things we're gonna hire a lobbyist in Tallahassee to do is to raise the issue of whether they should confirm the appointments of those people to the Florida Development Corporation, given that they're in the tank for all aboard Florida. There was an article this week that said, here are the people the governor is going to appoint, and all of them are in the tank for the project. That wasn't me. That was the newspaper it said. And so that's a point of failure in this project. The Coast Guard's a point of failure. The United States District Court, in several instances, is a point of failure. And that's why I'm not being overly optimistic in fact, they probably have smarter lawyers than me, and they're certainly going to have more of them. Um, but, you know, I like our chances. And I'm, I've become much more positive. I mean, my, my language at the beginning of the case was always, I think we can win. The ingredients are there. Now I'm telling you I can actually see the issues upon which we might win. And that's a big difference. We know what they are. 
So that's my answer to that. I think there's one important point to take away from Stand, the... Stand, Judy, just so oh. I can hear you better. I think there's one, one important point to take away from that day <coughs> when we were having the press conference and all of North Florida, coincidentally, had this big press release. And that is that we are enough to get their attention. And that's been because everybody has been very, very concerned and all coming together. When you talk about the grassroots element, that's important. When you talk about what we have brought to the tank, which is the, the legal aspects, the, the documentation, that's important. So everything coming together is what gives him the opportunity to stand before you and say, I think we can win this. And we didn't say that a year ago. No. But I didn't want to give up, and you didn't want to give up. And it was pretty bleak. Let me tell you something else they did that day. 45 minutes before we, we started, 30 minutes before, the fire and police chief of Tequesta, who were supposed to be out with the doctors, decided that they couldn't participate. So these guys were so good that they shook our witnesses who were about to go out in public who had agreed to do that and had promised that they would do so. They had to be taken off. We had to reprint.